Hey, how's everybody doing? It's been a while, but Coffee Talk with Bro Hockey is back. And I am back here today with Clint Dowd. Clint, how you doing? Good, good. Mark, thanks for having me. Really excited about this. Man, I, I am, uh, uh, I've been excited about getting getting back uh back in the microphone so to speak and and uh you know you and I talked a little bit recently and I, I you got a, you got a fascinating uh story um tell tell the uh tell the audience if you don't mind a little bit about yourself and and uh, uh what are you doing these days absolutely so first and foremost I'd like to always uh introduce myself as a man of faith grounded in faith um family um, super important to me, and that's what drives me every day. Um, but yeah, CEO and co-founder of Unifit Inc. Um, you know, uh, nowadays it's just kind of uh, summertime. So in the Dowd household, it's you know, summer's wrapped up, kiddos are back to school. A um, bit of a bittersweet moment for my wife and I. But you know, as much as we love having the kiddos around, and um, you know, for them being a blessing around all the time, but it's also a blessing for them to go back to school. Uh, so really excited about that. But outside of that, just a normal daily grind of running the company and basically ensuring we deliver excellence with passion. That's what we do. Oh, I like that. Excellence with passion. Oh, <laughs> man. I, I may have to steal that from you at some point in time. That's all right. So, you know, um, one of the things that when we when we first talk and when we first spoke and, and after we've talked a little bit, um, you know, there's a lot of organizations that a lot of companies out there that that do third party debt collections and and customer care. Um, what drove you, though, to start your own firm? Uh, it's an interesting question, uh, and I've thought about it a lot um, over the years. I'll tell you how how we started it uh, and what drove me, I guess, follows that. So. Uh, the company was founded actually by two friends of mine. We all worked together at Vandu Credit Corporation, if you remember that. Yeah. Um, at the time, collecting on default of student loans. And we were their top three collectors. We used to love to bug our VP of Ops, James Lincoln. Um, okay. And uh, just basically, we would go to him all the time, trying different strategies, vendors, technology. So we weren't your average debt collectors just sitting on a phone trying to get a commission check. We were more interested in driving how the company was going to do and where our mm -hmm. rankings were, so on and so forth. So, um, I mean, we even helped process improvements with document gathering when the whole income-based plans came out. Um, oh, nice. We were at a Christmas party just talking and I think it was James brought it up over, we were having a drink, the four of us. And he's like, man, if you guys ever did anything together, it would be, be a force to be reckoned with. And that kind of <laughs> idea stuck with me um, over the course of the next month or two. And then, um, I don't know, I've always had a knack for seeing people do things, whether mm -hmm. it's at a, uh, at a restaurant or whatever it is. And I could do that. I could probably even do it better, you know? So that's just the type of person that I am. I think what I'm just driven to perfecting processes or trying to perfect what it is that, you know, the trait that we're doing. So debt collection is just something that I was in at the time. I, I was doing it for about eight years. I'd you know, previous to Van Roo, I was at Aero Financial Services. So mm -hmm. I lived in both spectrums, working for the direct creditors and the debt buyers, and then went off to work for federal student aid as a debt collector. So I had a vast uh, eclectic range of industry experiences, um, both from not just from collecting, but also strategy and, you know, had had some ideas and I thought it would be a great idea. So here we are, you know, about 12 years later. That's that's awesome. Um, student loan student loan collections is is always been uh kind of interesting um uh you know when i started off my career i started off uh working for sally may um and uh that, that was that was back in the day um and uh it, it it's amazing to see and we'll talk a little bit about this um you know just how just how the 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 culture around debt collections you know has has uh transformed over the years um you know um you know you you've had you've had a really successful professional career um and you know i'm particularly interested in in your thoughts around this statement here um at this stage in my career i wish i could go back in time and tell my younger self whatever um and 
what would that thing be that you'd want to tell yourself and how would it have helped you navigate throughout your, uh, the remainder of your career up to this point? Yeah, no, it's, it's, that's, that's a good one. Um, so a little about myself. Uh, I grew up in Chicago in the city. Um, yeah. and the area that I grew up in, it was one of those places where if you wore the wrong colors, uh, you could pretty much get beat up, jumped or killed. I mean, it just depends. Yep. Um, although I never game banged, it was, wasn't the thing that I did. Uh-huh. You know, you grow up with this defensive mentality to ensure your safety. And it's kind of hard uh-huh. to explain, but some of those habits that are built out of the necessity of everyday life, um, mm-hmm. you know, don't create an optimal you. And if I can go back, I would definitely tell my younger self to be more trusting of people and to really surround myself with mentors and leaders that harbor the qualities and accomplish- accomplishments that I would want to achieve when I grow up. Um, yeah. You know, when I was growing up, it just was a lack of mentorship. You know, you typically expect that from your parents. But to be fair, my parents didn't grow up in the United States and moved here in 1980. I was born in 81. So raising, you know, me and my siblings, uh, you know, in a new country, it was challenging for them. So, you know, it's typical, it's a typical immigrant story, I guess. But Mm -hmm. to some degree, I mean, today's youth, I think they have outlets with podcasts, and there's a plethora of information. Um, that's out there. Um, if anything, it's an overabundant amount of information. <laughs> Trying to sort out what to listen to and what to drown out, you know, must yes. be challenging for you today. I would recommend them definitely listening to more of the Brohawk podcast and listening to some of the folks there. But, <laughs> you know, podcasts, social media, there's so many different places where you can get information and kind of be mentored, um, not directly, indirectly, but, you know, being able to pick and choose that information. And, you know, again, mm-hmm. going back, if I could tell myself, surround myself with the people that, you know, who, who I would want to be as I grow up that are successful, that are, and, and mimicking them. Right. Yep. I mean, you know, that, that's an important part in, uh, in how we, how we develop and how we grow into who we are as adults. Now, it, it's interesting, Clint, you know, being first generation, um, you know, American born, um, you know, I, I'm sure that, that growing up, your parents had a certain lens that they, that they saw things through, saw life through. Um, And, you know, how, you know, if you don't mind me asking, I mean, how did that kind of shape the lens that, that you grew up with? Um, Yeah. So uh, my background, my parents migrated from Iraq. We're Assyrians. Um, So we're like the indigenous people of Iraq, the minority (laughs) group there. We're Christians. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, just watching them and hearing their story and, uh, being able to, you know, come from there to here with really nothing on their backs. And that's, that's a typical Assyrian story. Not everybody, but that happened a lot. Um, you know, their perspective, their, the, the lens that they see the world through is much different than your average than, than my own Mm -hmm. lens today growing up in the United States. So you know, it, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to say it hardens you, but it gives you a different perspective, which um, you get to appreciate uh, the the freedoms and the, you know, just the, the, the quality of life that this country allows us to have. Mm-hmm. And I think that just having folks and having friends, actually, just that have been here generationally, two, three generations down, I think they kind of miss that piece. Um, and unless you're going out doing a missions trip out in the middle of nowhere or, and even though sometimes you're there for two, three weeks and you come home, you know, it's different, right. Being able to grow up there and experience it day to day for years on end. So I think that's, that's kind of, you know, what's shaped my lens too. It's it's their perspective in the world and how they saw the world has helped me shape the way I see the world. And and to be honest with you, be more appreciative of what, you know, of the, uh, the freedoms and the things that we sometimes take for granted here. Yeah, it, it, you know, not, not to go down too much of a rabbit hole, but definitely agree with you. And, and, um, you know, I, I, we'll have to, we'll have to have a uh, coffee and uh, we'll have to have coffee talk and, and dive in a little bit deeper off, off camera at some point. Oh, for sure. Uh, for sure. So, um, you know, the, um, you know, the debt collections industry and, and contact center industries as a whole have changed so much, changed and evolved over the last 10, 20 years so much. Um, what are some of the significant changes that that you've seen in the industries that you support? Um, and, 
you know, we'll stop there. And then I have a follow-up question that I'd yeah. like to ask as well. Yeah. So yeah, I, I agree with you. It's changed completely. Um, mm -hmm. You know, hands down technology has shaped the, and impacted the industry as a whole. I mean, we could sit here and talk about all the different tools and technology that is now available to help agencies become more compliant or productive. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to take a little bit of a different approach to that. I think what's really shaped uh, the industry is the internet itself. Um, mm -hmm. and what I mean by that is the internet just has a knack to expose light to areas in individuals and in business, just like no other. Sometimes it's a good light, sometimes it's a bad light, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what I mean by that is the, the fact that agencies, you know, that are historically, we would consider, you know, looking back now, bad actors or, you know, played in that gray area. It's just, it, it, there's no place for them to thrive or exist in today's society. Um, mm -hmm. You know, with Google reviews, BBB, CFBB portal, you name it. Um, agencies are left with pretty much only one approach, and in, in my opinion, and that's with empathy yeah. in regard to the consumer. Um, I think it's been a great change. And to be fair, that's been my secret sauce as a collector. Um, you mm -hmm. know, when I, when I, went into the industry, I think it was uh, very common for individuals to try to sound a bit scary and, you know, pose as individuals that they're not, maybe as an attorney or whatever. <laughs> and I think that that, you know, that might have worked to a degree, but it just wasn't the right thing to do. And, you know, over the first few months of me working, I, I started finding my own self. Um, and I always tell that to my collectors, and I used to train them. I used to always say, and it's still part of our training curriculum today, is you know, there's a there's a science and art uh, to collections, to anything, to sales or whatever. Yeah. And being able to um, take the science, the approach, and then take the art, the way you deliver it, and being able to bring those two together, um, really wrapped in an empathetic approach, understanding that you're dealing with another individual that's going through trials and tribul tribulations in their own life, yeah. um, you know, do unto others as you want done to yourself, right? If I'm going through problems and I'm sitting there talking to somebody on the other end of the phone, I would hope that they can be empathetic with me at my time in need. And mm -hmm. the way I've always looked at, you know, especially post charge off debt collections is people are in that situation, not because, and most times, right? There's certain, certain circumstances, but most of the time, it's not that they chose to be there. There were certain things in life yep. that led them down that path. Maybe their choices, maybe not, maybe outside their control. Regardless, that's not up to us to decide. And, mm -hmm. you know, I know this is kind of goes beyond more of a moral question and, but understanding, but it's, it's, I think it's as we're communicating with other individuals and it's our, it's our daily interactions, right? For a collector, that's their daily interactions with who they deal mm -hmm. with, the consumer on the other the phone is being able to put themselves in their shoes and being able to understand where that person came from and then coming to some sort of amicable solution that is a win-win, right? Or a win-win-win, yes. right? The way I've always used to put it was reasonable and affordable, right? It's got to be, it's got to be reasonable to the client, but it's got to be affordable to you. Let's figure out a way yeah. where we can kind of work together on this. So that was always my pitch. Um, and I think a lot of agencies have caught wind with that, at least the good agencies that I, you know, that I, that I know of and the individuals that are out there that are running them. I think that that's the approach that they, and they're successful. They do a fantastic mm -hmm. job because they're getting people. They understand people. So yeah. Yeah, I, I I love that approach, reasonable and affordable, and then being able to empathize. Because I I agree when I when I was um, working with my my frontline folks, I would always tell them, look, nobody wakes up in the morning, stretches, uh, and says, you know, I feel like defaulting on something today, you know, yeah, exactly. and uh, you know, it, it's it, it's it's amazing how many, um, especially back in the day. Um, how aggressive people tended to be. Um, yeah. And it became like, a you know, you did this and it, there's no place for that. I mean, no. bad things happen to good people. And uh, uh, I, I love the approach that, that you, that you go with it because uh, oftentimes, you know, I mean, when you, when even you look at, at fraud, um, oftentimes, you know, it's somebody within that person's family Um you know, it's some level or or a coworker or something that's actually perpetrated the fraud, yep. and they don't even realize that it's happened until they're getting a call from somebody saying, "Hey, you, you're in trouble." You know, and yeah. the the empathetic um, um, 
you know, um, debt collectors are, are, are the ones that will usually get to a resolution um, a lot easier, I, I would yep. say. Yeah. yeah. So um, excellent. So, you know, you, you are there certain um, technologies um, that you feel that are having a more positive impact on on the industry today um, more so? I mean, you mentioned the the internet and the availability of information and whatnot, um, but from a, from a technology standpoint, I mean, are, are there things that, that you're seeing from your seat that are seeming to have um, more of an impact or, or, or conversely, those that people are maybe talking about today that really won't have the the type of impact um, on on the industry that that they may think it. it I, I mean, I think I think the the main buzzword that everybody is talking about today is AI, um, yeah. and you know, Unifin and I I led this about four or five years ago. We developed our own debt negotiation software uh, mm -hmm. specifically for post charge off accounts. It's more of a self service portal where consumers can go and communicate with the system and mm -hmm. um, they're able to negotiate an amicable resolution to their, to their debt obligation. Yeah. Um, and it works, right? It, we were seeing a significant amount of people, especially over the last four years, as it continues to grow. Um, and we're, you know, sending out the demand notices and the different, you know, engagement, um, digital engagement ways that we're, we're trying to engage with these individuals to get them to go to our portal. Um, we're seeing them use it more and more. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, though, there is a desire at the end of the day for people to talk to people. Um, I think that there are so many different ways we can use technology. And I, I mean, I'm going straight to the debt negotiation platform because that's what we've built. We've built a few other uh, um, uh, applications that basically assist, assist us from a day to day standpoint. Um, but at the end of the day, to me, I don't think that the human touch is going to be replaced. Um, I, I just don't see it, right? Yeah. I'm just speaking from, I know it's anecdotal, I'm speaking from my own experiences, just, you know, how many times, I mean, how great can an IVR system get? At the end of the day, we're all <laughs> racing to press zero, right? Let's let's be honest, right? We're all trying to wait. We're all listening to, we're waiting, you know, option one, option two, yes. all the way to option nine. And it's uh -huh. like, sometimes there's no options. You're like, well, hold on. What was the customer care option, right? I want to talk <laughs> to somebody. I need to engage with somebody because, because I'm frustrated because I have emotional yep. needs, right? I need somebody to yep. hear me out at the end of the day. So that a system's not going to be able to do that. A computer is not going to be able to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And even if you do try to emulate that, and, you know, chat GBT and Claude and all these other cool AI tools and great, and they're great. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm not, I think that, you're gonna have to adapt and understand how those systems work. And you're gonna be, you're gonna have to incorporate them in some form or fashion into your business if you're gonna survive, you yes. know, this next decade, I would say, 100 percent without mm -hmm. a doubt. So I'm not a, I'm not against it, but at the same time, I think that there's too much being put into them because again, at the end of the day, you're gonna wanna talk to somebody. You're going to, you're going to want to communicate with somebody We're, you know, to me, human beings are more than just flesh and, you know, uh, flesh and bone and, you know, mind and body there, there is, there's an aspect to the way we communicate the emotional level of being able to understand one another. And that kind of goes back to what we were talking about the empathy approach. It's all ties in together. And I, I don't see how the computer is going to be able to, um, you know, uh, step in for that. So, yeah, no, I, I, I love that. You know, the um, there's, there's a place for, for technology. Um, but if, you know, if everybody adopted bots the way that um, uh, chat bots were supposed to have been adopted a few years back, um, then there, you know, there wouldn't have been nearly as many um, frustrated customers. Um, yeah. Or there would have been a lot more frustrated customers than there are today. Um, because, uh, you know, it, not every technology is perfect. And, and, you know, what I always say is not every supplier has the, has the, um, the best solution for every environment. So, uh, so our, our, our bread and butter at Unifin is debt collection, but a healthy portion of our business, almost 50% of it is customer care. Yeah. And, um, you know, we see that from a day-to-day -day standpoint, we see a lot of the customers trying to drive 
self-service and trying to drive customers mm -hmm. to a portal or to a chat or whatever. And a lot of the times you'll go to that portal or the chat, it's, you know, it's manned by a machine. Um, but at the end of the day, they're all racing, trying to get somebody on the phone, especially depending on what the, what the service is that that client of ours is trying to, if it's a banking service, we're talking mm -hmm. about people's money here. We're talking about, you know, somebody didn't get their ACH or there was a missing, uh, they don't recognize that transaction. It's just, there's no way. I mean, they're racing, trying to get, you know, human, uh, customer mm -hmm. care. So it, it's just, Again, I don't. I think that there's a great place for it for some of the um, aspects of the business that are more FAQ driven, mm -hmm. right? Um, where you can kind of just point somebody there. Great, got my question answered. I'm good yeah. to go. But again, I think majority of us, when we're calling American Airlines or whoever it is, right, we're trying to change our flight. You know, yes. the self service option can only do so much. You know, eventually it's going to be like, you know, wait, now you're next in queue. We're going to call you. Which is fine. <laughs> I mean, interesting fact too, and I thought I thought this was interesting. If you look at customer care as a whole, um, and you look at CSAT trends, um, DSAT trends, and things like that, post COVID, most mm -hmm. companies are just not fulfilling the needs of the people. And I think we're going to come to a point, um, and I'm just guessing here, um, that it's going to come back full circle. I think everybody's yeah. racing to AI right now. But I think everybody's going to realize very quick what their consumers are going to want. And you're going to have this push back. I don't know when that's going to happen, maybe three years, maybe five years. But eventually, there's going to be a push back to human interactions. It was kind of like the, the offshoring back in the 90s. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, what do you get when you call Capital One or Chase? Hi, this is Clint calling you know, you're from Phoenix, Arizona or whatever. They even tell you uh -huh. where they're from just to ensure that you know that they're from the United <laughs> States. So it's the same thing, right? Everybody was racing to go offshore, which again, there's a place for it. We we have offshore uh, staffing solutions and it's great, but at the same time, you have to do what the consumer wants. If the consumer yep. wants to speak to somebody, I think it's important that you staff and engage those uh, uh, those consumers the way they want to be engaged with. So you meet them That's where they're at, right? It's interesting. Um, so I, I do some work with uh, with JD Power as well. And um, one of the drivers of um, one of the key drivers of, of customer satisfaction in some of their some of their uh, material that they've published um, is knowledge of representative. And if if you don't, I mean, if you're relying if if you're relying on AI to deliver like agent assist or or you know whatever it is, and it's not set up properly you're going to have a poor, you're going to have a poor customer experience. Yeah. Um, and, uh, um, that, uh, this is the first year that, uh, that we've seen, um, knowledge, uh, step up to that number one place, um, uh, in, in, in some of the JD power data that, that I've seen. Yeah. Um, yeah. it used to be timeliness of resolution was the number one driver. And that that's now, that's now slipped back a little bit. So, which go hand in hand with one another. Yes, right? exactly. If you don't have a knowledgeable agent, your mm -hmm. call interaction with that person will take a lot longer. A lot of our a lot of our deals with our clients are based on a productivity per minute basis on the customer care side, and we actually agree in some cases depending on the volume sizes to certain caps. Mm -hmm. uh, calls can't go past 360 seconds or whatever, right? On a mm -hmm. overall because what we're trying to do is, although we're trying to, we're trying to, the best way to provide customer service is get the answers to the consumers as fast as possible. So they go hand yep. in hand, right? The call, the call length and the knowledgeable agent. If you have a knowledgeable agent, and we see this with time, especially with some of our new hires and our nesters, you know, yeah. they'll start out with calls at like a thousand seconds, right? Because they're scrambling, <laughs> trying to get information through the QRG or whatever, the knowledge base or whatever yep. it is. But by the time they get to their tenure, uh, of 90 days and beyond now they're you know they're pros they can they can they know how to whiz through the system they know how to get the answers right away mm -hmm. you don't gotta have especially when you're working certain tier one or tier two um customer care programs you know there's so you're gonna you're gonna understand what your top five call drivers are um yeah. and you should and you should be training your agents on those top call five uh, mm -hmm. those top five call drivers to be able to get the answers to them and be able to get those you know get those uh problems resolved as quickly as possible yeah that that's awesome. 
Um, you know, you having um, straddling the fence, so to speak, in both, you know, customer care and in and, and debt collections. I mean, you know, the ability to do both. It takes a, a different leadership style for, you know, for someone on the debt collection side or sales side versus, you know, customer care, uh, customer service side. So as a leader of people, um, what do you see the biggest challenges, um, you know, leaders in general are facing today um, versus what you may have seen earlier in your, your earlier in your career? Uh, yeah, it's a bit of a loaded question, especially when you're dealing with people, right? Um, <laughs> listen, business to me is basically a collaboration of people working together, um, mm -hmm. to accomplish a common goal. Right. And that requires some sort of transaction. That's business at the end of the day. That's the way I've simplified it in my brain. That's my definition of it. And mm -hmm. especially in the call center world, it requires leaders, uh, to basically understand and strategize, uh, on how they're going to engage with their clients, how they're mm -hmm. going to engage age with their clients, consumers. Um, and there's a third pillar to that, how you're going to engage with your employees. Um, so I don't think that um, this has changed much over the course of the last few decades, but what has changed is our society as a whole. And mm -hmm. in turn, with that change, we also have to understand and how we're going to interact with one another. I think the biggest challenge for leaders is just getting a grasp of what society is like today mm -hmm. uh, and how we can compromise with one another, regardless of our opinions or age gaps or whatever it is to achieve a common goal. There's always this yes. like talk about the millennials, right? Or, you know, <laughs> Gen Zers, right? Oh, those Gen Zers, right? It's just understanding them that their worldview, we talked about this, uh, you know, early on about the lens and yeah. Their worldview is different than ours, right? They're growing mm -hmm. up in a in a, in a post, uh, you know, uh, GFC or uh, a post COVID world, and mm -hmm. they didn't grow up the way we did. They don't understand what the two thousands or the nineties were like, or even the eighties were yes. like. So, understanding who we're talking to um, is really important. I, I think that what leaders really need to be more focused on is what is the objective that you're trying to accomplish as an organization, right? Mm -hmm. so that's your box, right? We're going to box that because you can't move outside of that without an identity and an objective that organization isn't going to be able to thrive. But the question then becomes is how are your people that are responsible for achieving that objective going to achieve it? And I think that's mm -hmm. where the, this goes back to the science and the art of things, right? Yeah. The art of understanding your people and sometimes allowing their uh, individualism, their creativity, um, their ability to uh, execute, so long as it's within the guidelines and parameters of your organization. And so long as the goal is to achieve that objective, yes. empower them to do what they do. And I think that's where yes. leaders are really missing the boat right now is not understanding um, individualism. They're trying to, it's like this whole thing that's going on right now with trying to push people back in the office. Like mm -hmm. I get it. Right. And trust me, I love uh, being around my people. I love being in the office. I, I it's just, I, I grew up that way. I started working when I was 13 years old. I, I get <laughs> it. Right. That's, that's, that was the worldview that I had, but at the same time, we have to meet people where they're at. And I think that there needs to be compromises at, as so long as you have the tools and understanding of is the objective being met? Can we measure, you know, through KPIs, through productivity reports, whatever, productivity, mm -hmm. efficiency, staffing, adherence. These things are important. You can't, you know, you cannot run a business without them 100 percent. So so exactly. long as you're meeting those and you're tracking those, how they actually do it, you know, let people be people, let them be themselves, let them let them shine as how they were created. Right. So that's just yes. kind of my two bits. I, I not, you know, obviously it's a, it's a, it's a thing for me because whenever I'm in my networking circles and this is a common question, right. And I think a lot of yeah. leaders miss the boat with just understanding the individual themselves and the person themselves and letting them be who they are. So. Yeah. And, and, and I would just add to that, you know, a little bit, Clint, not just understanding, but also understanding how they want to be communicated with. 
Um, so individualizing the your as a leader, your communication style to the person, um, as opposed to just saying, okay, this is the way I'm going to communicate with you. You just got to deal with it. Um, because that's going to create that, that poor employee, ex poor employee experience. Would, would you agree with that? hundred percent. Oh yeah. Just, yeah. I, I totally agree with that. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, and the way you put it too, it's, it's kind of like that boss mentality versus that leader mentality, right? Yes. And there is a, a massive distinct difference between the two. Um, uh -huh. You know, you want to be a boss. That's great. Good luck trying to retain your people and having them follow you, right? Yeah. You want to be a leader, meet them where they're at, communicate with yeah. them the way they want to be communicated, right? Um, yeah, I, I think that's super important. I, I love that. I love that. Boss versus leader. I actually got a job one time by asking the hiring manager that question. Do you want a manager? Or do you want a leader? And uh, they end up saying, well, they want a leader. Okay, so I got hired. So um, yeah. um I like that. It, it was effective um and, and i'm still friends with them today so this is good um yeah. so um you know you, you mentioned some of your networking circles um that um that you um that you rotate around in and whatnot you you, you gravitate towards any tips for how aspiring leaders um can create professional development or networking opportunities for themselves what should they be looking for yeah. So I'll be honest with you. This is something that I I used to struggle with a lot mm -hmm. um, and still struggle with it. Right. I'm not going to sit here and say I don't. Um, mm -hmm. I would say it's really important for individuals to be active in social in the social media space. I think that's mm -hmm. one place that you can network, especially today where everybody's, you know, working from home a lot of the times. Um, mm -hmm. But more importantly, just being active at conferences, trade shows, webinars. I mean, I think joining all these different spaces is really important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it could even be as simple as joining your local chamber of commerce. As sometimes we think of that as, well, what am I going to get out of that from a business standpoint? But what you end up getting is you end up getting an exchange of ideas, right? I think these mm -hmm. venues, if you go with the attempts, this, this is what I learned early on. And I went to my first conference. It was a couple of years into, uh, into establishing, and I had no idea what to expect. And mm -hmm. I went in there, especially for the first three, four years. I went in there with the idea that I'm going to go get business, right? Yeah. What ended up happening was I wasn't really getting business. And mm -hmm. what I realized, you know, after a few years was I'm, I'm not really utilizing what these events are meant for. And what they're really meant for is it's the exchange of ideas of individuals. You go to the, you know, you, you who are the speakers? What are they speaking about? Understand, getting these different perspectives are so, it's so important, right? Mm -hmm. um, these venues are, are a place where you can exchange ideas, sometimes debate topics. You know, you don't have yeah. to agree with the speaker, but, you know, you can have that conversation with them afterwards during the networking event. <laughs> hey, you said that, I don't, I don't really agree with you on that, but I see your point. And did you ever look at it from this perspective, right? Um, I think, as humans, it's just really important to constantly challenge our status quo. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you go into these events with the sincere um, idea and desire um, to truly go and to listen to other ideas and to engage with individuals of differing opinions, I think that you will grow as an individual. And at the same time, um, you'll make new friends and you know, yeah. at the end of the day, people are going to do business with people that they trust and they know, and they know that you could do the job and they understand you as an individual. No one's going to come to Unifin um, if they don't really understand who I am or who the leadership is like, because mm -hmm. what's the point? There are thousands of other companies offering the same services. What differentiates yeah. us from everybody else is me and my team and the folks that are there driving the day-to-day -day experiences with our vendors. And they, they, they trust us with their consumers, with their accounts, with their whatever it is and their product. Um, and, you know, the only way to get that done is if they get to know you as an individual, what are your beliefs? What are you grounded in? Who are you mm -hmm. as a person, right? So I think that's what, if I can, you know, give any tips to aspiring leaders, don't go into these things with a sales hat on. Go into them with an open mind that you're going to network, that you're going to be able to meet other people, but be like a sponge, right? Give and take. 
um, is what I would say. Develop the relationship, not not try and get the transaction. Hundred percent. Yeah. 100%. Transactions will only last so long, um, is what I tell people. You know, you know, meet people. Going back to the communication, meet people where they're at, find out more about them, develop that relationship. Because at the end of the day, like you said, people want to do business with people that they trust, they respect, um, and there's not that transactional relationship with them. So. Yeah, it's it's actually helped us as an organization. I mean, when we started, um, you know, Unifin has evolved, <laughs> I don't know, three, four times over the course of the last decade. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we started out as a subcontractor servicing defaulted student loans for uh, mm -hmm. on the FSA contract. And then we went off to servicing debt buyers, which we still do today. Um, mm -hmm. And then after that, because there was a need for it, right? How It was always, how can I help you? That's what I transitioned to was my question is, what can I do for you? What are your pain points? What are your needs, right? How can mm -hmm. we assist? Uh, do you do customer care? You know, and at that time, I didn't. But, you know, as the um, aspiring entrepreneur that I am, I, I don't, but I could, you know, well, yeah. let me give you a shot. Just, you know, here's, here's, five, give me five people, see what you could do. And that's kind of yeah. how we grew, right? We grew from first party to customer care, to back office processing, mm -hmm. to social media handling, to, you know, e-Oscar, whatever. And we have all these different individuals now doing all these different things, because at one point or another, I said, what do you need? And they said, well, I don't need debt collection today, but I do need somebody to help me with this. And we will do that. And as recent as, uh, you know, a little bit over a year ago, I had an individual and said, hey, you know, you have some offshore sites. Uh, I said, yeah, they're mine. They're dedicated. Um, you know, I don't need you to manage. Uh, uh, you know, I don't need to outsource a process or a department to you. But what I do need is just individuals. I need an individual to fill this position. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, send me your job description. Let me take a look at it. I'll send it over to my marketing team. We'll put a marketing analysis on it. If we hire them, we'll handle the payroll and the, and the, uh, and the HR We'll charge you, you know, whatever over their salary just as our as our way of you know doing business. And then that's your person. That's your dedicated resource. And now yeah. we're close to over, I think, 30 people in the last year, just because word of mouth awesome. referral. People are just like, I need that. I need that. Um, yes. So I think it's really important to being um, uh, malleable and being able to understand. I'm not saying I'm going to take any job. I had a, recently I had another guy ask me, Hey, I have this product, you know, I'm looking to license out. Do you want to sell it for me? I'm like, that's not what we do. That's not, yeah. not in my, not in my wheelhouse. So it's not everything that I take, but if it's, if it's reasonable, you have the infrastructure. Like for us, we had the infrastructure for, we had a huge recruitment team. We're already, you know, volume recruiting for our, uh, our, our clients. Um, mm -hmm. And it was just a matter of, I sent it over to, to the recruitment team. I said, Hey, can you look at this JD? And they said, yeah. And it just became a process. And it's just yeah. now it's a service that we offer. So, you know, I think that, it's really important to stay flexible um, and just really listening to what people want and need. And you'd be surprised at how much growth you'll see, you know, yes. and it might, it's not going to happen overnight. That is not an overnight, you know, success yep. story. It takes time. It takes relationships. It takes persistence. And I think at the end of the day, you know, you'll win the hearts and minds of the people that you're networking with. So. And, and, and a certain amount of failure too. And, you know, recognizing those failure points, Yeah, you know, yeah. learning from those failures too. Exactly. Really, yeah. Yeah. It's exactly. not really failure at the end of the day, right? You might think it's failure at that point, but it's a learning experience and it's great. You, know, you gather what you can from that moment and you adjust, right? Yep. It's really important. Uh, I'll tell a, I'll tell a funny story about that, which kind of falls into the whole networking thing. When I first went to my first conference, I had no idea what to expect, expect. And, uh -huh. um, this is my first time going there. I literally went in my like church suit, right? And <laughs> I get there and I'm looking around. And the first thing I notice, and I'm very, I'm a very observant person. And, you know, at the time, everybody's wearing the khaki pants and they're wearing the navy blue sports coat, no tie. Yeah. I'm there with a tie, you know, my gray suit. It was just, you know, it was, it's <laughs> funny. And obviously, styles have changed over the course of the last, you know, decade or so. But <laughs> I, I realized quickly I was like a fish out of water, right? Trying to, trying to get, uh, trying to do business, not going to the, uh, not going to any of the speaking events and just kind of, you know, roaming around, didn't have a plan, just, just there, mm -hmm. right. Didn't yeah. really talk to anybody, didn't really meet many people, but, uh, I got to meet a few people sitting around talking to people, but it, it was, it was eye opening, And I realized quickly, cause the next conference, I had changed my whole wardrobe. I was, yeah. you know, so I wanted to fit in. Right. And then it, these things evolve over time. Um, so yeah, you learn, you learn from 
those failures and those mistakes. And it wasn't like my second time going to a conference was a home run either, because again, my, my, my objective wasn't, wasn't aligned properly to what I should have been doing, which really was to go and try to get the most out of the engagements and the networking that, you know, that occurs at these places. So. I, I, I love that the whole concept of alignment there, um, you know, and, and aligning your objectives um, to what the, what the situation is, is, is about. So, yeah. uh, awesome. Well, Clint, we are getting to the point of this, uh, of our conversation. I call it speed round. Are you ready? <laughs> no, I don't think so. No, I'm ready. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. First question. What fact about Clint would people be most surprised to learn about you? Uh, most surprised. Um, I never went to college. I'm, really? I'm, YouTube, I'm YouTube educated. That's awesome. That's yeah, awesome. I've learned, I've learned everything that I that I know through business and uh, everything that I know about business and, and just studying through, again, these networking events, listening to yeah. people, being, uh, being a sponge, um, picking and choosing the right uh, influencers on YouTube that are beneficial to my growth as an individual. So, so yeah. That's that's awesome. That's awesome. I do want to dive into that at another time because I, I'm interested um, for other reasons, you know, about that. But um, so after you've had a stressful day, what's your go to tactic to just unwind? Um, so <laughs> it, it, a lot of times it causes more stress is, is trying <laughs> to spend time with my kids. Um, but uh, I've had the benefit of uh, of having a sauna. Um, I used to have an infrared sauna. Now I have a full sauna in my house today. So the sauna, then shower just before bed. But with the sauna that I've learned recently in the last couple of weeks, and I think that you might benefit from this and whoever else is watching this is something called binaural beats. Binaural beats. Okay. And binaural beats. And I'll, I'll kind of give a quick uh, what they are. Apparently, and I'm just learning this myself again, it's been a couple of weeks, but they're working. It's amazing. Um, is the idea here is that you have five different wavelengths that your brain um, operates in, right? You have uh, what's called the delta, the theta, the okay. alpha, the beta, and the gamma, right? Okay. And each one of these brain waves can be... Um, associated with sound and hertz, right? So what binaural beats does is you can, you'd have to use headphones or your buds, put okay. them in your ear. And it's the difference between the waves of what each ear is hearing. And the okay. difference is if it falls between one and three hertz, then that's a delta wave. It's very long and slow and those delta waves are when you're sleeping that's what your brain is in it's in that delta wave pattern then it goes to the theta waves which is just about sleeping right and those hertz are somewhere between i think three and eight hertz okay. so the difference between the ears three and eight hertz when you're about to fall asleep you put on those you listen to those binaural beats and you kind of start dozing off and there's a lot of science behind this actually one of the science uh one of the um and I, I'm a nerd. I'm on PubMed a lot, just kind of <laughs> looking up different things. And I was actually on PubMed reading one of the science, um, uh, one of the studies they did on this. 97% um, increase in melatonin production just by putting those really? and listening to, yeah. So you have the, you have the delta, the theta. Then you have the alpha, which is kind of like what we're in right now. We're in that yeah. alpha stage where we're, we're cool, we're calm, we're collected, we're listening, we're talking, we're engaging. That's your yeah. alpha brain waves. Then you have beta, which is like being at the gym or being excited, right? That's up to, I think, that 20 to 25 hertz. And then anything past that goes into that gamma range, which we don't really experience often. And I don't think there's a lot of studying on the binaural beats when to get to the gamma, but gamma is like jumping out of a plane or base jumping, right? Your brain waves okay. are going to be really short, fast. And what's crazy about this, what the studies actually prove are, how your brain, one, uh, receives that information and then being able to tap into your endocrine system and releasing hormones such as melatonin or mm -hmm. adrenaline. So what I've been using it for is, like you said, 
just before unwinding, I'll put on my binaural beats after my sauna and my, my I'm, I'm out. Right. I was taking yeah. like, I think two or three milligrams of melatonin just because my, my brain, I, I have a very alpha person, personality, constantly thinking, Oh, I, I can mm -hmm. do this. I can't shut it off. Right. So I need, I need something to shut it off. So like melatonin was helping me kind of calm me down and go to sleep. This, I haven't taken melatonin for the last two weeks and it's helping. It's helping me doze off. But even That's the last awesome. couple of uh, weeks, the last week or so too, I've been listening to the beats just before I walk into the gym. And there okay. is a response. So it's really interesting stuff. I think, you know, you should definitely look into it because oh, yeah, I'm, still, definitely. I'm still researching it myself, but it's very cool. Oh, very. Um, yeah, you'll have to you'll have to kick me over some uh, um, some articles on that. I will. Yeah, I will. For yeah. sure. For yeah, sure. That, that, that's awesome. Well, last question is, you know, you know, you, you've done you've done so much um, in your career um, over the last 20 years or so. Um, if somebody wants to pick your brain about the work that you that your company does, um, some of your experiences that you've had um, or just wants to you know chat with you um you know just because they they find this conversation uh pretty interesting and like man i'd like i'd like to just kind of you know chill out with clint for a while what conferences events um you know would you or do you typically attend and or how could how could uh, folks contact you next conference i'll be at is the uh dcs conference okay uh, name love that conference a fantastic job they do they do such yeah. a great job um but to be fair, I think the easiest way to contact me is look me up on LinkedIn. I'm active on LinkedIn um, and always open and connecting with everyone. I don't care if you're a salesperson. I just probably will ignore you. But you know, <laughs> um, no offense, no, no offense. Ab ab absolutely. I I'm always open and connecting literally with anybody that sends me a request. I typically will connect with them. I have no, no, uh, no issue with that. And I'm always open to engaging. If anybody ever wants to pick my brain on anything and mm -hmm. wants to engage, or if there's something that you feel like, you know, I said during this podcast, you want a challenge? Please be open to sending yes. me a, an angry message. I'll, <laughs> I'll be more than happy to engage and 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 and, uh, and hear you out. So, but yeah, excellent. Well, Clint, thank you very much. I appreciate um, how generous you've been with your time. I mean, running a company, I mean, uh, and and taking time out of your your schedule, especially on a Friday afternoon, which is when we're <laughs> recording this. I really appreciate that. Um, you know, if anybody wants me to do an introduction with Clint, feel free to feel free to ping me. I'd be more than happy to go ahead and do that. Uh, Clint's a great guy. We've had just a few conversations, but I'll, I'll tell you, um, yeah, I want to buy this guy a beer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mark, thank you. And man, again, congrats on all the success with the podcast and what you're doing. And you just had a phenomenal career and, and just kind of, you know, I, I'm sure there's a lot. I'm hoping that this continues to develop into a friendship and I'm sure there's a lot that we can learn from each other. So thank you. I, I would agree. And I, and I look forward to it. Um, well, thank you very much. If you like this pod, if you like this episode, please like, comment, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, and uh, for more for more great content like this conversation we've had today with Clint. Clint, thank you very much. I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thanks, Mark. Nice talking to you.